it's, it's such a pleasure to see this place so full for an event like this at a time like this. Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, let me introduce myself, because I am new to this institution. I'm Lina Khatib, and I have the pleasure of introducing myself as the director of the SOAS Middle East Institute. Um, <laughs> and first of all, I want to say a warm welcome to your excellencies who have made the time to be here with us today, even though, of course, there is a lot more going on in this, in this region. I highly appreciate the presence of the ambassador of the UAE and the ambassador of Palestine uh, joining us tonight. <laughs> and of course, all the members of the diplomatic services who are also with us tonight. There's too many of you to, to name, um, but it's really uh, very um, encouraging, to be honest, to see that at a time like this, the Middle East still looms large in our hearts, and this is what the SMEI, the SOAS Middle East Institute, is all about. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Caroline and Sir Tim Lancaster from the um, Mohammed bin Isa Al Jabir Foundation. Now, you may not know or you may know that the origins of the SMEI began a long time ago here at SOAS as the LMEI, which at the time stood for the London Middle East Institute. And it was thanks to um, Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Isa Al Jabir and his foundation that the seed was planted for us to be here today because that was how the SMEI began. For many years, it was known as the London Middle East Institute, and it did really great work to really put the Middle East at the heart of London. Here we are now in a new iteration celebrating tonight the launch of the new SOAS Middle East Institute, emphasizing that this is very much about SOAS and how much we love being affiliated with SOAS us as a place that really embraces creative thinking and innovation about the region. And here, again, I have to send huge thanks to our director, Professor Adam Habib, who is also gracing us with, a, with his presence tonight, who is playing a huge role in transforming SOAS to what it is today, which is a place that is globally connected, not just when it comes to the Middle East, but the rest of the world. Uh, this is the place where the creative thinking is happening. This is the place where great people like yourselves come together and engage in fantastic conversations, not just about the challenges uh, that the world is facing, and here particularly the Middle East, and particularly at this time of great turmoil in the region, where, as we know, there is devastation at an unprecedented scale, especially in Gaza. And this is something that we, as the SOAS Middle East Institute, have been engaging very closely on, and not just through looking at the challenges and the suffering of the people, which of course is very important, but also through shedding light on the creativity, shedding light on the talent, shedding light on all the positive stories that happen in this region in spite of all this turmoil, in spite of all the violence, all the suffering. This is a Middle East that we are proud of and that, you know, I'm so happy that all of you are here to celebrate with us having the SOAS Middle East Institute as a platform for talking about these issues, for highlighting all the positive stuff happening in the region, but also thinking about solutions and potential alternatives for the challenges faced in this region. And in this regard, there's no better person to inaugurate the SOAS Middle East Institute through a public lecture than Sheikh Sultan Saud Al Qasimi. Sheikh Sultan needs no introduction, but I will just briefly say he is one of the most renowned public intellectuals of the Arab world. Uh, he is uh, a commentator and a thinker and a, and a writer on politics, art, culture. He is a champion of art from the Arab world, especially contemporary and modern art, and he, in fact, is one of the world's biggest collectors uh, of art from the region. And some of you may know that he has spent the last few years uh, giving uh, a course that he designed on 
politics and art uh, from the Arab world at renowned universities all over the world. And I'm very happy to announce tonight uh, that we have uh, Sultan having behind the scenes been working with some of our students at SOAS from, the, uh, from different disciplines, but mainly from the School of Art, on co-curating an exhibition that we're going to host at the Brunei Gallery here at SOAS uh, from July till September this year. And it's co-curated by SOAS students using the Bergil Art Foundation, which is the art foundation that hosts Sultan's collection. It's a foundation that he created due to his passion uh, about art uh, from the region. Uh, he is someone who represents the values of the SOAS Middle East Institute in terms of progressive thinking, in terms of ethics, in terms of focusing on creativity, but also diversity, which is at the heart of the Middle East. So without further ado, please welcome Sheikh Sultan Saud al Qasimi. Thank you. Good evening, uh, everybody, and uh, thanks to uh, my dear friend uh, Lina Khatib uh, uh, for this very, very generous uh, introduction to be, uh, to be said to embody the values of uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies and the Middle East Institute is a huge honor that I hope I can live up to. I also want to say that um, it's a huge honor to be addressing uh, a crowd that includes so many renowned individuals, uh, including uh, their excellencies, the ambassadors who are here, uh, Mr. Adam Habib, uh, some of some some scholars that I uh, that I follow and I and I uh, admire so much, and uh, a lot of the research that you will see uh, here emanates from. Uh, uh, individuals who are here in this room uh, today, uh, Venetia Porter, of course, Nadine Nouruddin over there, Maisa Kafil, um, and so many others. I need to wear my glasses just to check who else is here. <laughs> but, but so many others. We have uh, Saeb Eigner. I mean, this room is uh, bursting with, uh, with intellect and with some of the uh, most important scholars, of course, Dr. Rida Mumni. I mean, I can go on and on. Uh, there are so many people here, so congratulations. And uh, I think congratulations to me that I was able to attract uh, all of you. <laughs> so lower your expectations. Um, um, and finally, uh, um, you know, we are going to be going, uh, since some of you didn't know what the talk is about, so they asked me, what is this talk about? I think people just wanted to meet each other and, uh, and see each other in different circumstances. So this is a talk about uh, uh, political art by Arab women artists. So there's nothing by men in this, uh, this presentation. It's 100% works by women artists from across the Arab world. So we will go on a journey across the Arab world through the eyes uh, and the paintbrushes of uh, women artists. Uh, um, let me begin by saying, um, as someone who is interested in Arab modernity and the 20th century especially, um, I often think of art in historical context. Uh, the Egyptian revolution of uh, 1919 that led to the commissioning of Mahmoud Mukhtar's Renaissance d'Egypte or Egypt's Awakening monument, or the Nakba or catastrophe of 1948 that resulted in the expulsion of 700,000 Palestinians, including artists uh, such as Ismail Shamut and Zulfa Saadi, and the courageous Algerian uprising against the vicious French occupation in the 1950s and 1960s that was captured in countless monuments, songs, stories, and artworks. Today, however, uh, numerous other uh, natural disasters and political conflicts have plagued our region, causing the destruction of homes and lives and livelihoods. In Sudan, it has sent tens of thousands into Kenya, Egypt, and Ethiopia, including artists Galal Youssef, Thabian Bahari, Bakri Muad, Yasser Al Ghari, and Hani Khalil Jaudat. And sadly, in our beloved Palestine, Another Nakba or catastrophe is taking place in front of our very eyes and screens, resulting in tens of thousands of deaths and destruction of infrastructure, including cultural institutions. Already, we lost leading poets such as Rafat al Arir, photographers including Majd Arandas and painter Muhammad Sami. And on October 13, 2023, Hibazagud, 
a 39-year-old painter that captured Palestinian homes, landscapes, and individuals focusing on Palestinian identity, was killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. She was one of countless victims of the ongoing Israeli aggression against Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. It seems humanity's cruelest attributes have resurfaced in the 21st century, and there is no end in sight to the death and carnage. History, however, also shows us that good must prevail over evil and right over wrong, no matter how long it takes. Now to today's lecture. Just over a century ago, in 1923, the Egyptian Feminist Union held its first meeting in the house of pioneering feminist Huda Sharawi, said to be an artist herself, demanding the reformation of the personal status law as well as women's suffrage. In the meantime, and despite there not yet being a school of fine arts for women, leading women uh, names started to emerge, such as Amy Nimmer. In fact, when the Cairo Fine Arts Institute was inaugurated in 1908 with an impressive role of students including Mahmoud Saeed, Raghb Ayad, and Yusuf Kamel. It did not include a single female uh, student. Women in Egypt and across the Arab world would have to wait almost three decades until an institution dedicated to training women uh, artists was opened in 1937. This may explain why young Egyptian women such as the aforementioned Amy Nimmer, resorted to studying abroad in institutions such as the Slade School of Fine Arts here in London, where she enrolled in 1916. This three-decade gap effectively meant that men had a head start of an entire generation over their female peers, thereby allowing them to ingrain themselves in society and be included in major museums and collections of institutions such as the Cairo Museum of Modern Art that was opened in 1932. Lack of education opportunities, however, was not the only obstacle that women artists faced across the Arab world. Islamic inheritance law also meant that they would have less access to funds um, in case a, a parent passes away and social norms added an extra layer of challenge. The 1920s witnessed a proliferation of women artists from across the Arab world. In addition to the aforementioned Eminem of Egypt, names such as Mary Shiha Haddad emerged in Lebanon, while Sophie Halabi's landscape of Palestine reflected the serene beauty of the land. Mary Haddad, who was born to a prominent family of Lebanese bankers, started exhibiting in the 1920s in Beirut and in 1933, through a political contact exhibiting, uh, namely the French ambassador to Lebanon, Le Comte de Martel, she was invited to take part in the prestigious Salon d'Automne de Grand Palais, thereby becoming the first Lebanese artist to do so. She would later take part in the official Lebanese pavilion of the famous New York uh, World's Fair of 1939, both a political and spiritual statement, Haddad would employ her paintbrush to depict Salim al-Ashi, arrival of the Lebanese president, Bishara al-Khouri. The 1930s, ladies and gentlemen, was a decade of great promise in the Arab world. It witnessed the first solo exhibition of a female artist, perhaps anywhere in the region, that of Zulfa al-Saadi, whose July 1933 debut at the Palestine Pavilion at the first National Arab Fair in Jerusalem included paintings of leaders such as Salah al-Din, who recaptured the holy city of Jerusalem from the Crusaders in 1187 CE, and Sharif Hussein bin Ali, leader of the Great Arab Revolt. Sadly, few of her works survived as she was displaced in the Nakba of 1948 settling in Damascus until her passing and is said to have never painted again. Other parts of the Arab world, such as Tunisia, saw artists such as Saida bin Salah, 
whose paintings depicted Tunisian women and who participated in the country's official art salon for more than one year, but sadly faded into obscurity following her passing. And the 1940s witnessed a number of major developments with the first ever solo exhibition of an Arab female artist in a Western institution. 1949, Iraq's Madiha Umar uh, held her first exhibition at the Peabody Library at Georgetown University, where she was studying, following, followed by another show at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art the following year, 1950. Women's paintings became bolder and more assertive as the second half of the 20th century commenced and calls for national independence grew. For instance, in demonstration, a 1949 painting by Tahiyya Halim, a large group of protesting Egyptians are seen carrying banners and pushing against royal Egyptian guards wearing the tarbush or a fez. This event may be related to the assassination of the Muslim Brotherhood leader, Hassan al-Banna, on the 12th of February, 1949, whose death was blamed blamed on Egyptian secret police. In, 1950, in 1951, Elji Flatoun created a painting titled We Cannot Forget, depicting four coffins shrouded in the flag of Egypt, a drape with a crescent and three stars being carried by a sea of people. These coffins were said to contain the corpses of citizens from the Suez who died while protesting the British occupation of Egypt. It is said that stencils were created from this artwork and numerous replicas were made of it, although the final fate of this work is unknown. The subsequent collapse of the Egyptian monarchy the following year emboldened women artists to depict scenes that they may perhaps were reluctant to portray during the years of the monarchy. For instance, in this 1955 painting by Gazbiya Sirri, uh, the infamous 1947 Mahalla incident, where in order to quell a strike by factory workers supported by student activists, the Egyptian government deployed troops and tanks, killing three workers and injuring 17 more. The authorities' response was said to have been so harsh that protesters were pushed into the Nile Delta. Other artists who have revisited past themes of brutality and injustice include Inji Iflatoun's depiction of British forces uh, overseeing the execution of an Egyptian farmer named Hassan Mahfouz in the Dinshaway incident of 1906. British soldiers are depicted standing in formation, overseeing the executions while holding rifles while the corpse of an Egyptian citizen is carried away and the family is watching in the background. In January 1952, this was the original slide I was going to begin with, less than two miles from where we are now sat, the Institute of Contemporary Arts of London launched an international sculpture competition to commemorate, and I quote, all those uh, unknown men and women who in our time have been deprived of their lives or their liberty in the cause of human freedom, end quote. The competition garnered global interest with three and a half thousand submissions and 80 works that were entered into the competition, including Iraq's Jawad Salim, which you see here on the left. This is the only work by a male artist in the presentation. <laughs> Maquette for a monument to the unknown political prisoner, 1952-1953, uh, was uh, amongst an, uh, Fatima Muhib, sorry, Amongst the array of artists who sent in proposals was a lesser known female Palestinian artist called Fatima al muhib who was born in Jericho in 1920 uh, and educated in Egypt's prestigious Higher Institute of uh, Fine Arts in Cairo. She emphasized the female figure standing uh, up uh, with her uh, eyes uh, blindfolded, surrounded by three kneeling individuals one child and two adults. Her right hand is carrying a scroll, indicating her plight. The representation of a woman's body as a political prisoner 
was clearly a conscious choice by the artist whose submission was one of 80 accepted into the competition. Jewish women artists of the Arab world also actively depicted political events. Amongst them was Maryam uh, Ben, nay Mary Lee's Ben Haim. Like many of her fellow communists from across the Arab world, uh, Ben was actively engaged in the anti-colonial movement and supported the Algerian National Liberation Front for which she was sentenced in absentia to 20 years hard labor. In this 1960s artwork, uh, Maryam Ben references a notorious incident on the 8th of February 1962, known as the Sharon Subway Massacre in the 20th arrondissement in Paris, in which nine anti-colonial protesters were killed by the French gendarmerie, and over 120 were injured. She denounces the OAS, the Organisation Armée Secrète, the French paramilitary organization that brutally suppressed Algerians. In fact, the Algerian War of Independence was a pivotal moment for many women artists of the Arab world. Singers such as Warda al Jazairiya, Warda the Algerian, and Fairuz sang songs of solidarity and freedom, specifically naming activists such as Jamila Buhirid and their, in their lyrics, while the war pushed poet and writer Etel Adnan to start writing in English as a protest against the French establishment and also shifting her focus to visual art as a creative means of expression, which is why you see Etel Adnan's work sort of emerging in the 1950s in her third and fourth decade. Baya, the acclaimed Algerian artist, was also said to have refrained from painting during the eight-year-long Algerian struggle for independence. Other artists adopted a more literal and figurative method. From Syria, we see the work of Hala Quwatli, who came from an Arab nationalist household, her father being the former president of uh, Syria, Shukri Quwatli. Quwatli depicts the aforementioned Algerian independence icon, Jamila Buhirid, surrounded by other protesters as she reads a declaration under the Algerian flag in 1958. Only a black and white picture of this painting exists. And according to the artist, it may have been bought by someone from the Algerian embassy in Damascus. We have no idea where it is. By the late 1960s and 70s, the theme of women as refugees was repeatedly visited during this period by Arab women artists. Amongst them was Egypt's Zainab al-Sagini, whose monochromatic somber painting depicts a group of women huddled together while a child is covering her eyes. We move to the Gulf. In 1977, Dubai-born artist Najat Mekki received a scholarship from the government to study in the College of Fine Arts in Cairo. During the studies, she produced this relief sculpture, a clay composition titled Palestine, which depicts four women and three doves one of which appears to be imprisoned behind steel bars, while another is perched on an olive tree branch, which continues to be a symbol of Palestinian identity and resistance. In the center of the relief is a woman wearing a traditional araqiyya, a woven head cover, traditionally worn by married women in parts of Palestine, looking over her daughter with an eye of concern for her well-being. In the center of the relief appears the word Allah, which is a reference to the strong faith that these Palestinian women hold. According to the artist's uh, daughter, Elsa Martayan, writing in Orient 21, Simone Baltaxé was born to immigrant parents who fled anti-Semitic pogroms in Ukraine in the early years of the 20th century. After escaping anti-Jewish raids, in, uh, in France, she left Paris for Lebanon in the 1950s. She was one of the first foreigners, and moreover Jewish, to go to the Palestinian refugee camps. She brought back several studies which depict their miserable condition just a few years after the Nakba. On the lower right of the foreground of this painting, we see a group of children innocently playing while the center 
depicts a standing mother nursing her infant while in the background, uh, the, while the background is dotted with tents that many thought would be a temporary shelter until they were allowed to return to the homes that they fled in 1948. Another lesser known artist is Suad Malhas, who was an active member of the Jam'iyat al-Fan, the Arab artist group of Jordan, later changed to Rabi'at, changed to Rabi'at al-Fannanin al-Tashkiliyin al-Urduniyin, the Jordanian Plastic Arts Association, which was established in Amman in the 1970s. According to researcher Yasmin Tuqan, such associations offered a space to reflect on and impact the potential movements of the time. Malhas depicts a group of women in refugee camp surrounded by tents while two white pigeons or doves are perched on a wooden ledge nearby, perhaps as a symbol of elusive peace. The tragedy of Gaza was definitely, was definitely depicted by its very own late great Leila Shawa, who lived in London for a number of decades before she passed away in October 2022. Shawa went on to create a number of artworks depicting Palestinian suffering at the hands of the occupation, including in this 1989 painting titled The Three Marys of Gaza, which captures the agony of Palestinian mothers in the wake of the first intifada of 1987, which saw the killing of 142 Palestinians in its first year alone. In her 1965 painting titled Gaza, the artist depicts a cactus grove laid on a plain ba uh, uh, brown background. The cactus for many is a symbol of perseverance and strength. Characteristics often attributed to the Palestinians themselves who have endured decades of displacement and occupation. The artist's father was a prominent politician, activist Rashad al-Shawa, who served as a mayor of Gaza in the 1970s and 80s before he was forcibly removed by the Israeli occupation. And of course, it is important to mention that there was a very important cultural center in Gaza named after Rashad al-Shawa that was destroyed in the past few weeks. And I really hope it is rebuilt. In fact, this painting that you just saw survived a direct hit when the Shawa family house in Gaza was attacked by the Israeli forces in the 1980s. Despite all the horrors, the painting evokes hope. It depicts a flowering cactus in bloom in the spring season when the yellow edible fruit is produced. You see the painting hanging in the family home. Leila Shawa sent me this a few months before she passed away. Sorry. Arab women also depicted scenes of martyrdom, including Leila Nseer, who's painting the nation, the martyr, from 1977, directly references the death of Syrian charity worker, Marie Rose Boulos, at the hands of militiamen. During the early years of the Lebanese civil war, Ms. Boulos had volunteered to look after death mute and blind children, from whom you can see here mourning her passing while her co-workers and friends carried her body. And notice how when women depict these scenes, they place women at the forefront and men who are there are placed in the background. So uh, women notice what we do to them, so they do the same back. <laughs> they push us back, okay? So uh, keeping in the theme of uh, a martyrdom, Palestinian artist Fatin Tubasi also referenced Palestinian martyrdom and the Lebanese civil war in her 1984 painting depicting martyrdom known as Heroic Act. The actual name in Arabic is Amal Fadh. I don't know how to translate it. Which was created two years after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. Tobasi, who studied at the Repens Academy of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg in the early 1980s, portrays a mother looking over the laying body of her daughter that is draped in the Palestinian flag. Uh, the graffiti in the background, in case you don't need Arabic, includes phrases such as to Palestine and the steadfastness of Beirut, and we will resist 
to the last drop of blood. I'll tell you who this painting represents now. It is said to reference uh, the artist himself, herself says, the 1976 killing of Lina Nabulsi, who a lot of you who know Palestine will know this history, a 17-year-old daughter of a prominent Nablus family who was chased and killed by an occupation soldier simply for carrying a Palestinian flag. More recently, leading uh, Sudanese artist Kamala Ibrahim Ishaq created a painting titled Blues for the Six Martyrs to reference the Sudanese protesters who were pushed or killed by militiamen and then dumped into the Blue Nile, many of whom were said to have concrete blocks tied to their feet, according to one report in The Guardian. So these are individuals who are looking up at you uh, from the river itself, from the Nile itself. Very somber. Arab women artists also depicted their country's leaders. From simple portraits to political acts. In 1970, Saudi pioneer artist Safiya bin Zagar depicted King Faisal, who was a renowned modernizer and reformer, introducing, for example, public education for girls in, in the Saudi high schools. In 1973, King Faisal led an Arab oil embargo as a response to the US backing of Israel in its war against Egypt and Syria. While leading Tunisian fine artists and the first native director of the School of Fine Arts of Tunis, Safiya Farhat captured the last known portrait of the anti-colonial polit uh, political activist Farhat Hashid days before he was killed in 1952 by La Main Rouge a French terrorist organization operated by the French Foreign Intelligence. One of my favorites. Moroccan artist Malika Aghizni depicts in the semi-abstract painting King Hassan II leading the Green March of 1975 that saw 350,000 Moroccans advance into the Western Sahara Territory. Uh, you can also note the use, the use of Arabic calligraphy invoking God's name, as well as the red Moroccan flag featuring the lone star. However, no other leader has been depicted as often as Gamal Abdel Nasser by countless artists, male and female, from across the Arab world. Can you guys see where the king of Morocco is in this work? Should I point to you? In this instance, we see Tahiyya Halim showcasing Gamal Abdel Nasser on a boat dressed in upper Egyptian costume, reaching out to a Nubian man while holding a bundle of wheat, which is here a symbol of livelihood. Ironically, and despite the title of this painting, The Happiness of Nubia, Abdel Nasser's policies would be detrimental to the people of Nuba in pursuit of his dream to construct the high dam in Aswan. Nasser would force the relocation of dozens of Nubian villages. While other Egyptian artists who depicted Gamal Abdel Nasser include Maryam Abdel Alim. We'll see a work by her very soon. Many women chose to depict their fellow women as protagonists and not simply victims especially in the wake of major conflicts. In 1968, for example, this painting by Syrian artist Maysoun al-Jazairi, women are shown to be carrying knives and swords while standing outside their homes in order to protect their families and themselves. The date is relevant here as it has come one year after the 1967 defeat of the Arab armies at the hands of Israel and the occupation of the Golan Heights the Sinai, Gaza, the West Bank, and Jerusalem. Earlier, following the 1956 tripatriate aggression, Fatima Ararji, who was the director of the Alexandria Faculty of Fine Arts, depicted women uh, alongside men carrying rifles as they advance eastward. So you see more women depicting women fighting back, defending themselves, not simply being uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, submissive or being weak, which 
which I think is very, very important when it comes to uh, uh, art history. The social dimension of women's struggles was never absent from Arab women artists' work. While the intimate moments of motherhood is a universal theme that, uh, that many Arab women artists chose to portray, Inji Flatoun's depiction of mothers in jail with their children is unlike many portraits uh, uh, in the mid 20th century in Egypt. The very theme was revised and revisited by other artists such as Gazbiya Sirri's Prison Children in 1959. Both these artworks follow the amendments made to the Egyptian penal code, expanding the provisions under which women could be sent to prison. While in Syria, Lebanese artist Darriya Fakhouri depicted the 1958 to 1962 Syrian drought that heavily impacted the country's production and export of wheat and barley. The darkness of the background emphasizes the sorrow and the critical condition of the mother with a child in her arms. Racism and race is a constant theme in the work of artists of the Arab world. In this 1973 painting by Palestinian artist Tamam al-Akhal, a laborer called Sleiman from Jericho is depicted. Jericho is home to one of the largest populations of Afro-Palestinians, many of whom are descendants of pilgrims who came to Palestine, especially during the Ottoman period. In a reflection of the harsh realities facing modern artworks from the Arab world, this portrait of Sleiman was damaged by a shrapnel during the, during the Lebanese civil war. You can you see it, the shrapnel is uh, just above the forehead. The American civil rights movement provided inspiration to Arab women artists to both show solidarity and inspiration to their own struggles. Both Inji Aflatoun and Gazbiya Sirri depicted African-American women in, of that era. In Aflatoun's case, it was a portrait of the revolutionary Marxist and feminist political activist, Angela Davis, the one on the right, in black and white. By the way, many of these works in black and white, we don't have colored pictures of them, so we have to rely on these uh, old photos. Syrian artist Leila Nsayer, we saw her work earlier, a dark painting of a Vietnamese man laying on a bed of skulls and bones was an angry critique of the years-long vicious American onslaught on the Southeast Asian country, Vietnam. Annika Linson, assistant professor of global modern art at UC Berkeley, notes that the, the lying figure bears a slight resemblance to an African-American figure as well. In 1965, the year this painting was made, African-Americans accounted for nearly 25% of all combat deaths in Vietnam. Going to Morocco, Maryam Mezian's dignified depiction of African-American men depict, dressed in elegant Moroccan jellaba, the traditional kaftan, uh, featuring hand-decorated embroidery known locally as Asfifa, was a repeated theme in her oeuvre. The 1991 and 2003 Iraq wars were reflected in a number of paintings by leading women artists, beginning with those from Iraq itself. In, 19, uh, in 1991, Afifa Al-Laibi painted Gulf War, uh, which depicts a woman standing hands lifted as though she is about to be crucified while arrows are fired at her and the relief, uh, and the relief of Ab uh, Abkalu, one of the seven Sumerian sages uh, figures at the temple of uh, Ninurta at Nimrud. The woman clad in white, a color often associated with pureness, virginity and innocence has her eyes closed as she is subjected to brutality and violence. A dozen years later, Egypt's Maryam Abdel Alim's fall of Baghdad sees a swarm of crows descend upon the Iraqi capital as injuries and deaths abound. Amid the chaos, families are separated and refugees are on the move. Abdel Alim's prophetic artwork foreshadows the destruction of Iraq that suffered for the next decade and a half from senseless violence that took the lives of 300,000 human beings. In 
Um, Suad Al Attar, a leading Iraqi artist based in London since 1976. By the way, did I show you the earlier slide? Yes. So now, Suad Al Attar, a leading Iraqi uh, artist based in London since 1976, depicts the destruction and fires engulfing what was known as the City of Peace. Following the American invasion of 2003, this painting is an impassioned homage to the irreversible loss and distress experienced by Baghdad's inhabitants. Now to peace. Arab women artists also tackled the theme of peace uh, even during the colonial era. For instance, Lebanese artist Blanche Ammon was invited to present works at the Lebanese pavilion in the 1939-1940 New York World's Fair. For the occasion of the New York World's Fair, she created four large murals each depicting a peace agreement between the Phoenicians, Lebanon, and a neighboring civilization, including the Egyptians and the Jews. According to researcher Maha Aziz Sultan's book, L'Art au Liban, du mandat français à l'indépendance, the Lebanese government had asked the artist Philippe Morani to oversee the Lebanese pavilion in 1937 under the theme of Phoenician Salon, which is probably where she got the inspiration from. As you can see here, the Phoenicians are signing a peace agreement with the Egyptians or with the pharaohs. Several years, uh, several decades later, at the height of the Iraq-Iran war, Bahraini artist Balqis Fakhru created a painting titled Face to Face, showing Persian King Xerxes I meeting with Babylonian King Hammurabi on the shore of the Gulf. Behind them, architectural monuments from both civilizations are featured. Approximately half a million men died on both sides of the conflict over eight years of fighting with countless injuries, while the fate of many others remains unknown. Is this an incredible piece? Coming to the end. The Arab Spring provided many intellectuals and artists with opportunities to express themselves through creativity. Amongst them is Yemeni artist Amna Nasiri, who studied at the State Academy of Art in Moscow before taking up a career both as an artist and instructor at the University of Sana'a. Amna Nasiri who participated in the protests, depicts a sea of men and women congregating in Change Square in the capital of uh, Sana'a in the early days of the Yemeni spring of 2011. Final slide. The Ta'if Accords of 1989 brought about the end of the 15-year-long Lebanese civil war that resulted in 150,000 deaths and the immigration of over a million Lebanese citizens. Recollecting that occasion, artist Lor Ghoreib cre uh, created this painting called Reconstruction, Reconciliation, Withdrawal, 1990, 2005, which reflected the themes of the Ta'if Accords and the date in which the Syrian military finally withdrew its forces from Lebanon. The artwork is filled with political slogans, such, uh, such as the phrase, we demand freedom, and the name of assassinated Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri, while the phrase, tomorrow we play together, appears between both children. From the early 20th century onwards, Arab women artists aspired to an equal footing with their male counterparts. In many cases, even beating them to major milestones, despite the many obstacles in their personal uh, uh, and professional career journeys. Contrary to what some people may believe, that Arab women artists were complementary to their male counterparts, with some significant contributions here and there. I hold that Arab art history cannot, uh, simply cannot be written in full without considering the sizable contributions of women artists. From the co-founding of major movements like, the, like Iraq's Hurufiya by Madiha Umar, the Baghdad modern art groups Naziha Salim, the crystallists Kamala Ibrahim of Sudan, the Awsham movements by Mahyiddin, 
the Egypt Contemporary Art Group, Zainab Abdel Halim, the statement against artistic racism by N.G. Aflatoun, not to mention Salwa Rawda Shukair's seminal 1941 text, How the Arab Understood Visual Art. All these and more are a testament to the pivotal role that Arab women artists played in the formation of the Arab art canon. What's more exciting for me personally is the process of learning the names of these women artists with the help of many scholars and friends, some of whom are in this very room with us today. Ultimately, this is a collaborative effort between scholars, researchers, collectors, museums, uh, and one that will benefit us all. Thank you so much. I mean, I could listen to Sultan forever. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Sultan for this really wonderful, wonderful encyclopedic uh, uh, knowledge of yours that you are now so generously sharing with us. And I'm uh, really happy that you have also accepted being affiliated with the SOAS Middle East Institute as a research associate. You're our inaugural research associate and the community at SOAS and all of us here will really benefit from your, from your presence with us. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, <laughs> I just want to briefly thank uh, the small army of people behind uh, the scenes who have helped uh, make this event happen. Uh, everybody at SOAS from the Advancement Office to uh, my own team, uh, especially Gloria and Imran uh, from the SOAS Middle East Institute, Aki, who is the engine. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And all the vol student volunteers and everyone who made this event happen. And we can now go have have a drink. Uh, we have a reception in the Senate House building, so I'm afraid you'll have to brave the cold for a minute, uh, moving between one building and another. Uh, you'll be hopefully shown the way by the small army. And uh, last but not least, I want to say that we have also an advisory board for the SOAS Middle East Institute, and we have some of them with us here tonight. Uh, please feel free to mingle with them at the reception. Uh, in no particular order, we have Professor Matteo Legrenzi, who's come all the way from Venice to be with us here today. <laughs> We have uh, Dr. Venetia Potter, who I'm sure a lot of you already know. Uh, Dr. Ghad Al Harithi, who is a SOAS PhD. <laughs> uh, and last but not least, our very own Professor Dina Motar. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today and join us uh, uh, if you have the time. As I said, you'll be escorted. Thank you so much. And this talk, by the way, has been recorded, so you can watch it again. Thank you. That was so beautiful. It was wonderful.